everyone. My name is Robin Wilson. I'm Gresham Professor of Geometry, and it is my greatest pleasure tonight to introduce Simon Singh to give a lecture on the history of the Big Bang. Simon has visited Gresham College on many occasions, but this is the first time he's actually given a Gresham lecture. You will all know him, of course, from his books, his book on Fermat's Last Theorem, which sold many, many thousands of copies, and also the Code Book. Or if you don't know him from the books, you'll know him from his television programs. He did an <coughs> outstanding uh, program about Fermat's Last Theorem, which won many awards. And uh, a couple of my trips to the United States have been mu made much, much more pleasant on the, on the plane flight when I switched on the Discovery Channel and heard Simon talking about codes. Uh, anyway, he's not going to be talking about those tonight. It's his new book, which is coming out. It, uh, after this uh, session, there will be a reception downstairs to which you are all invited, and it'll give you a chance to meet Simon and to buy his book. And there's, a, 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 I gather, a two-pound discount if you buy it this evening. And so without any more ado, let me ask Simon to give us the talk on the history of the Big Bang. Simon. Thanks a lot. I'll have to you. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. As Robin said, I've, I've come here many times to, to hear lots and lots of talks by very eminent speakers, so um, it's a great honour to be here um, in this prestigious college. Um, the reason, or one thing I should say before I, I begin, um, I came up with the title for this book about two years ago, um, and so it was very frustrating and annoying when three months ago another book was published with the same title. Um, this is Big Bang, Everyone's Guide to the Sexual Universe. <laughs> and um, I just want to show this, just in case there are people here under a misapprehension, because you'll be very, very disappointed. Um, <laughs> the, reason, the reason I wrote this book was because um, everyone's heard of the Big Bang, um, but I don't think many people really understand what it is, or who came up with the idea, or why we believe in it, or why we believe in it today more than ever before. So I wanted to explain the, the whole theory of the Big Bang, and as I say, its history and how it came to be. And in, in so doing, I realise it's actually a book about how science works, how new ideas are born, how new ideas are tested and proved and finally accepted, this idea of what's called a paradigm shift, when the old idea gets dislodged and thrown away and replaced with a new idea. So... Um, the Big Bang is a book about the Big Bang, but it's also a book about how science works, and I'll try and touch on both those areas this evening. Um, I'm going to skip lots of things. Um, I'm only going to get as far as the point in the history when the name Big Bang was invented, and, uh, and then I'll try and stop there. But we'll have time for questions. So if people want to ask about modern cosmology or uh, go back to things I've covered already, then please, please do ask those questions. I'm going to start with the old paradigm, the old view of the universe. In 1930, Sir James Jeans, um, the astrophysicist, wrote a book called The Mysterious Universe. And he wanted to tell everybody how cosmologists in 1930 understood the universe. So this was a popular account of physicists' understanding of the universe in 1930. It was a big hit. Everybody read it, including Tallulah Bankhead, the Hollywood screen goddess. She said it contained what every girl should know. So... <laughs> It was a very popular account. But despite her claim that it contains what every girl should know, it didn't mention the Big Bang. It talked about um, an eternal universe, a universe that had been here forever, one that would remain here forever, and one that was static, one that didn't change. It was the same yesterday as it would be tomorrow. The Big Bang, on the other hand, which we'll come to in a minute, talks about a universe that um, has a finite history, that sort of has some origin and which changed from that origin into the universe we see today, and which continues to evolve. So two completely different models. So why do people believe in the static model? Um, to be honest, there wasn't much evidence in, in its favour. Um, the only reason people really believed in it was that it was a nice, consistent, coherent view of the universe. If the universe has been here forever, you don't need to ask any nasty questions like how it was created, when it was created, or who created it. So... It's a nice, self-consistent theory, but without much foundation. Whereas when the Big Bang comes along, the Big Bang followers really have some concrete evidence in their favour. And the first evidence in favour of the Big Bang appears here at Mount Wilson. Um, sorry, I've got a bit of a sore throat. and If I don't swallow this pastel now, I'm going to choke on it. So I might as well... 
Right, so this is Mount Wilson. Um, this was an observatory, is an observatory still in Southern California, just outside LA. For about 30 years, it had the biggest telescopes in the world. And um, its director was probably one of the most eminent astronomers of the first half of the 20th century, Edwin Hubble. And he would work at the, at the observatory for many years, spending many long nights staying up on the cold mountain top, Mount Wilson. It got very cold at night. He would often talk about how his eyelashes would freeze to the telescope eyepiece. Um, and uh, here you see, this, I mean, this is just the bottom of the telescope here. But when you see the whole thing, you can see how gigantic it is. It's a big 100-inch telescope. This is, I think this is Palomar. And you can see a very dapper chap, very charismatic. Um, indeed, when Hubble's wife first saw him, when she first clapped eyes on him, um, she described, he, he was stood there looking at a photograph of the night sky and studying it intently. And she described him as an Olympian, tall, strong and beautiful, with the shoulders of the Hermes of Praxiteles. There was a sense of power channeled and directed in an adventure that had nothing to do with personal ambition. So she was clearly smitten with him. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, she was married at the time. Um, but three weeks later, her husband fell down a mine shaft and was killed. So um, there was kind of a happy ending there, really, I suppose, um, of sorts. Um, so Hubble um, used these magnificent telescopes and his huge intellect and his charisma to corral a team of astronomers to measure the universe. And um, he did two things. The first thing I'm going to skip over. Um, he measured the distances to the galaxies. So here's a galaxy. We live on the Earth. The Earth goes around the sun. The sun is a star. And the stars congregate into these swirls called galaxies. Um, our galaxy looks like this. We can't really see it because we're inside it. So this is one of our neighbouring galaxies. I think it's Andromeda. Um, and the universe is peppered with these galaxies. And Hubble was the first person to work out how far away these galaxies are. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip this bit, but um, this is the woman who developed the technique that Hubble used. So Hubble's measurement was based on a technique invented by Henrietta Leavitt, and she worked as part of a team of women. Women weren't really allowed to be astronomers. It was thought unladylike to stay up late at night in the cold, damp, um, with men staring up at the romantic moonlight, so starlight. So, so all they could do was analyse the data. Uh, this is the Harvard Observatory, where they took half a million photographs over 20, 30 years. And so it was an industrial effort, these women with magnifying glasses, looking at every speck of light, measuring its brightness and its position. And because they looked at the data day after day after day, um, they saw things that the men had missed. And there are two women here, uh, Henrietta Levitt, who we've just met, and Annie Jump Cannon, who made incredible, you know, world-class contributions to astronomy without ever having access to the telescope. They were called computers. Where people in the past who made calculations were called computers. Then the term came to mean a machine that did calculation. Um, and they were also known as Pickering's Harem. That's Edward Pickering in the corner. And this gang of women really um, transformed uh, the analysis of astronomy and also came up with some dramatic conclusions. Um, and uh, we can come back to them later, maybe. But th the main point uh, of this little detour is that Hubble measured the galaxies using Henrietta Leavitt's work. She studied a type of star called a Cepheid variable, and Cepheid variables were discovered by John Goodrick, a Yorkshireman. And so you have this idea of ideas being built on ideas and scientists standing on the shoulders of giants and so on. But that's just a little detour. I'm going to skip the distance measurements. Because the other thing that Hubble did um, was he looked at all these galaxies, he measured some of their distances, and then he began to wonder, what do the galaxies do? Do they just loiter there in space, floating uh, motionless? Do they move about randomly? Um, you know, do some of them come towards us? Do some of them recede? What, what are the galaxies doing? He wanted to measure the dynamics and motion of, of the universe. And uh, to do this, the only thing you can ever do in astronomy, really, is to, is to analyse the light that comes from the galaxies. So light is a wave. And um, see, that here's a pointer. So here's a wavelength. Um, the wavelength is the distance between the two peaks. If the wavelength is 700 nanometers, 700 billionths of a metre... That's red light. All red light has that, has that wavelength, or roughly that wavelength. If the wavelength is shorter, about 400 billionths of a metre, that's blue light. So the wavelength tells you everything about the light you need to know. It tells you its colour. And by analysing the colour of the galaxies, uh, Hubble could work out their speed. Now, the way that works, 
I'm just going to take a slight detour into sound, because sound is also a wave, and sometimes the wavelength is short, that's a high-pitched noise. If it's long, that's a low-pitched noise. High-pitched, low-pitched, short wavelength, uh, long wavelength. So just like light can be long and red or short and blue, uh, the same with sound, except we're talking about pitch rather than colour. Now, this chap, um, Christian Doppler, was interested in objects emitting sound. Mm -hmm. So here's a, an object emitting sound, and we're looking at it from above. So it's sending out waves, almost like a, a, a frog tapping the water and sending out ripples. And the wavelength on either side is the same. Both microphones hear the same sound. So, um, so yes, yeah, so you know, the wavelength is the same on either side, uh, uh, so the receiver gets the same sound. But if the object starts moving, and this is what Doppler was interested in, if the object moves to the left, um, then the waves get squished in that direction. Because if I emit a sound wave and I move towards it, when I emit the next one, it's going to be closer and closer still. Whereas on this side, they'll get dragged apart. So now the two microphones hear different things. The microphone um, on this side, let me uh, see if I can get my cursor up. Here we go. Microphone on this side here is short wavelength. That's a high pitch. Uh, microphone on this side here is a longer wavelength. That's a lower pitch. Uh, and so it knows that the object is receding, even though it might not be able to see it, but it knows it just by being able to hear it. So again, if a car comes by, if a car goes behind you and it goes... It, as it approaches, its pitch will rise, and as it recedes, its pitch will drop, and it'll kind of go, meow, because as it comes pro towards you, the wavelengths will get squashed. As it leaves, the wavelengths will get dragged apart. Even though you can't see the vehicle, you'll know its sort of motion by analysing its sound. And um, let me just show you. It took me two hours to program this, but here we go. Oh, no, it didn't work. That's a Wednesday afternoon wasted. Now, why didn't that go? Let's try again. Oh, dear. So why am I like... Do I need to take it off mute here, do you think? Oh, no, that's working, that's working. That's working. This isn't incredibly important, but there's some sound later that I, I will want to play, definitely. No. I'll get my speakers out while I'm waiting. Um, so that's still in there. That's working. That's What's happy. Like on your oh, that's a good point. Maybe I muted it. Yes, I'm sure I did, actually. Fantastic. <laughs> Mandy's been an absolute he hero this afternoon. <laughs> this is only one of many calamities that she's fixed this afternoon. It's been chaos, but she's... Uh, so here we go, two hours work. I really should I really should do something more useful with my time. So and in fact you, I can demonstrate it even better. So here's a little beeper that sends out a pitch. I'm gonna swing it around my head, and as it comes towards you, you'll hear a higher pitch, and as it goes away, you'll hear a lower pitch. So you should hear a little kind of modulation. Can people hear that? Yeah. I, see, I can't hear that because I'm in the middle. So it isn't coming towards me or away from me. It's always constant. So I don't hear the effect, but hopefully some of you heard that pitch modulation. So this, theory, this is just a theory. This was based on mathematics. Um, but it was tested by Christoph Boys Ballo. Um, he tested it by getting a group of trumpeters, and he put them on an open train carriage and got them all to play E-flat, and then he got another group of trumpeters on the platform and got them to play E-flat. And as the carriage approached, he could just hear the pitch increasing. As the carriage receded, he could hear the pitch was slightly lower. So how does this work for light? Well, exactly the same thing happens. If the object is coming towards me, if the galaxy is coming towards me, the waves get squished. That's a shorter wavelength. That means it looks a little bit bluer than it should. If I'm on the other side and the uh, object is moving away from me, then the wavelength will get stretched. That's a longer wavelength. It'll look a little bit redder. All the galaxies emit a sort of the same set of colours. They ought to emit the same set of colours. But Hubble realised that if he could actually measure the actual colour, if it looked a little bit red, we call that a red shift, it must be moving away. If it looked a little bit blue, that's a blue shift, it must be moving towards us. So by analysing the colour of a galaxy, you can work out what it's actually doing. So just to summarise that, I'm going to play you a song. This is really why I wanted the music, the sound working. This is the Cosmic Doppler song by the Chromatics, the only a cappella 
uh, astronomical band in the world. And they're going to talk about various things about spectral emissions and frequencies. Uh, I've been talking about wavelengths, but it's all the same. The important thing to remember and what they're going to reinforce is that if the object's coming towards you, it's blue shifted. If it's going away from you, it's red shifted. So here we go, the chromatics. By looking at the spectrum of the light that's glowing It's dumb or shameful, tell us if it's coming or going That's the Doppler shift You see it, it's true Doppler shift To the red or the blue When a star is approaching and it's coming our way Its spectrum seems blue or won't you hear what I say And when it starts retreating way out of range And the scientist measures it Frequency change, but that's a red shift, red shift If the star is moving away Okay, it's not, it's not the most wonderful song in the world, but I guarantee you will never, ever forget red or blue shifts in your life. <laughs> so what happened when Hubble measured these red shifts and blue shifts? Um, he looked at several galaxies, but these are just the results for three of them. Um, here are the distances to those particular galaxies, 9 billion, uh, billion kilometers away, 220 billion billion kilometers away, and 1,200 billion billion kilometers away. When he looked at the first one, it was a little bit redder than it ought to be. If it's a little bit redder, it's moving away, and the amount of redness implied it was moving away at 6 billion kilometers a year. So it's a little negative sign to imply it's moving away. He looked at the next one, next one's further away, and it was even redder. So it was moving away even faster at 170 uh, billion kilometers a year. Third one, red again, 730 billion kilometers a year. And uh, these speeds are incredibly fast. Uh, uh, if, uh, these, these sort of galaxies cross the Atlantic in a couple of seconds. These are a few percent of the speed of light. Um, enormous velocities and all of them moving away. And the more galaxies that Hubble measured, the more of them were moving away. There were only one or two exceptions to this rule. And this is extraordinary. This is the first evidence in favour of the Big Bang. If everything is moving away from us, then tomorrow it'll be even further away. Or yesterday, it would all have been a little bit closer to us. A year ago, a little bit closer still. A hundred years ago, closer still. And at some point in the past, it would all have been compacted here right on top of us. And Hubble could even work out when that happened. If this, if this galaxy here is 9 billion billion kilometers away, and it's, let's say it's always been moving at this speed, we can divide the distance by the speed, and we can say it would have taken 1.5 billion years for that galaxy to have got that far away. If you look at the next one, 1.3 billion years for that galaxy to have got that far away. So 1.3 billion years ago, that galaxy would have been right on top of us. And the third one, 1.6 billion years ago. Now, if you're an astronomer... If you're an astronomer, those three numbers are identical. <laughs> um, I've said one of my favourites, I'm apologies if you've heard this before, but astronomers, you know, give or take a billion years here or there, it doesn't matter, it's all the same. Whereas mathematicians are incredibly precise and physicists are sort of somewhere in the middle. And as the story concerns a physicist and a mathematician and an astronomer going to Scotland on holiday, and um, the astronomer, they see fields containing a black sheep as they cross the border. And the astronomer says, look, all sheep in Scotland must be black. And the physicist says, no, 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 only some sheep in Scotland must be black. And the mathematician looks at the other two and shakes his head and says, no, no, no. All we can truly say is that there exists in Scotland at least one field containing at least one sheep, one side of which is black. So, <laughs> so this is a different order of magnitude in terms of precision. Um, but, but, I mean, actually... the. the the, the amount of light that's being detected is minuscule. Uh, the amount of red shifting is minuscule. So to get this level of coincidence is extraordinary. All of those numbers have an error about them. And so when you get that kind of coincidence, it's telling you something important. It's telling you that one and a half billion years ago, or between one and two billion years ago, uh, everything was created and compacted in one place, and then it expanded and exploded outwards uh, in something we call a Big Bang, and it's still expanding and exploding outwards today. That was Hubble's observation. 
And um, the interesting thing was, um, people had already theorized this. This is Alexander Friedman, a Russian cosmologist. He already had said the laws of physics would allow for the universe to be expanding. And he wrote a paper about it and he published it. Um, but when Einstein saw it, Einstein, uh, he said it was suspicious. The non-static universe, i.e. one that's expanding, appeared to Einstein suspicious because Einstein believed in a static universe, one that had been here forever. Uh, Friedman died tragically young before Hubble made his measurements. But his ideas were rediscovered by Georges Lemaitre. And Georges Lemaitre again said, look, the laws of physics would allow for the universe to expand. And uh, he hypothesized the notion of a Big Bang. He didn't call it a Big Bang. He called it, uh, he spoke of a day without a yesterday. A very poetic way of describing this moment of creation. He imagined all the matter being compacted into one uh, primeval atom. And just like the uranium atom is very unstable and uh, fragments and throws out particles, he imagined that the mother atom would be unstable and would throw out particles in the Big Bang event. And as you can see, um, he was a priest. And again, people didn't really take him seriously. And part of their prejudice arose because um, they thought, well, if he's a priest, maybe he's trying to get God in through the back door. You know, that, you know this creation, this Big Bang implies there was a creator. Uh, but Lemaitre always said, you know, I have my religion on one side and I have my science on the other. And I don't let one, no, one tells me about the material world and one tells me about the spiritual world. So he didn't try and marry the two. He once said, there are two ways of arriving at the truth, and I decided to follow them both. And um, he, you know, he resolved that conflict. It's the same conflict that Galileo had. He was a devout Catholic, and uh, he was a, a great scientist. And uh, he said, uh, when he was looking at the models of the heavens and the stars and the planets and the solar system, he said, look, the Bible tells me how to go to heaven. It doesn't tell me how the heavens go. So again, he managed to resolve that conflict in his own mind. Um, when Einstein heard about Lemaitre's theory, Einstein already heard all this before from, from Friedman, uh, and he didn't like it anymore when he heard it from Lemaitre. He called Lemaitre's ideas abominable. So at this stage, you might think Einstein's being unfair, but remember, at this stage, we don't have Hubble's, theory, Hubble's observations. All we have is theory, and theory doesn't mean much unless you can back it up with proof or observation. Um, anybody can come up with a theory. Um, it's the fact that it matches reality that makes it important. Uh, and that test with reality is absolutely critical. Unless you have that test or that proof and that evidence, uh, with theories you can prove anything. Maths is a very funny thing. You can, uh, you can even prove with mathematics that the Teletubbies are evil. Um, let me just show you how that's done. The BBC put a lot of time and money into the Teletubbies. So the Teletubbies are clearly a product of time and money. We know that time is money. So that's money times money, or money squared in mathematics. We also know that money is the root of all evil. <laughs> so money squared is evil, so the Teletubbies are evil. Um, I should stress this is just a theory. Um, it hasn't been proven yet. Um, so the thing is, anyone can come up with a theory. And um, it doesn't matter how important you are, how beautiful your theory is, it's the check against reality that matters. And somebody once said, there's nothing more tragic in science than the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And that, that's really what it's all about. That captures the whole idea of science. But in 1927, Lemaitre comes up with his theory. In 1929, two years later, Hubble comes up with some proof. Hubble actually sees the expansion. And yet in 1930... James Jeans writes this book, The Mysterious Universe, where he doesn't mention the Big Bang. So then the question is, why is this man not talking about the Big Bang when we already have some theories and we already have some evidence? Well, one reason is that Hubble's data implied that the universe was one or two billion years old. We looked at that when we sort of measured, divided the distance by the t speed. And geologists could date the rocks on the Earth, and they knew that the Earth was three and a half... Now we know it's near a four, four and a half billion years old. So the Big Bang implied a universe that was younger than the Earth. And that's clearly absurd. So people who didn't like the Big Bang could just say, look, the theory is absurd. It doesn't make, sorry, it doesn't make sense. Um, we can just ignore it. So that was one very good reason. So what, obviously the one or two billion years is wrong, and we might maybe we'll come back to that later. 
Um, the other reason that people didn't believe the Big Bang Theory is, um, is less obvious, but I'm going to try and explain it in a, in a slightly tortuous way. Um, this won't make much sense for a, a while, but just bear with me. So this is Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I'm going to play it backwards to you, and I want you to tell me if you hear any words, okay? So this is Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven, played backwards, and it'll just sound like gobbledygook, but some of you might hear the odd word. Um, here we go. Who, who heard the word Satan? Okay, a few people. Okay. Did anybody hear... Did anybody hear... It's my sweet Satan, the one whose little path will make me sad, whose power is Satan. Oh, he'll give you, he'll give you 666. There was a little tool shed where he made us suffer sad Satan. Did anybody hear that? <laughs> it was just me, was it? <laughs> right. Okay. So we're swiftly moving on. Um, I'm going to play that to you again. And this time, I, at least half of you will hear every single word there. I promise you this is the same piece of music. I haven't switched it. I haven't tampered with it. It's exactly the same piece of music, played backwards. But this time, I'll highlight the words as we go through it, and you will hear every single word. Or uh, uh, Some of you certainly will. Who heard chunks of that? Quite a few people, quite a few. Okay, well, that's great, few. It's not just me. Um, the point of that is um, twofold. One, it's just fun. I think it's just amazing. Um, I, I, that really blew me away when I first saw that effect. The second point is that the first time you heard it, people didn't really hear anything. Some of you heard the word Satan, because probably some of you expected to hear it. But when I showed you the words, and I said, look, you'll hear this, suddenly a large, more than half of you, heard it. So once I sort of told you what to expect, once I'd primed you, your brain began to do more interpretation. It began to see things. Obviously, it is just gobbledygook. It is just random noise which very vaguely fits these words. But your brain is such a powerful computer, it interprets it and reads things that really aren't there. Um, now, when I first, when I'm sat here the first time, I just can't believe you can't hear this. But then I forget you've not been primed. I've heard this so many times now, I cannot not hear those words. It's just unbelievable to me. Um, and the point, I suppose, is that when you're told what to expect, you see the things you want to see. And that can happen in science as well. If you're a scientist and your colleagues have told you that the universe is eternal, and your teachers have told you that the universe is eternal, your professors have told you your, the universe is eternal, your colleagues and Einstein even tells you that the universe is eternal, when you get some data and the data isn't very good, you make it fit your belief. And Hubble's data wasn't that good. It was a bit higgledy-piggledy. So scientists who didn't want to believe in the Big Bang could interpret it in their own way. So here's a chap. Um, this is a chap called Fritz Vicky, an American um, astronomer. Um, he was quite a grumpy chap. If he didn't like you, <laughs> if he didn't like you, he'd call you a spherical bastard. Um, a sphere is an object that looks the same whichever way you look at it. And a spherical bastard is someone who's a bastard however you look at them. Um, and um, he said, 
OK, the galaxies all look a little bit red. I can't argue with that. That's what you see. That's what other people see. We've checked it. Everything looks a little bit red. Um, that's not because the galaxies are moving. I'm going to interpret it my way. The reason they look red is that the galaxies are very massive. If the galaxies are massive, there's a huge gravitational force. So as the light leaves, the gravity pulls on the light. It saps its energy. And that would make the light look red. He called it tired light, the tired light theory. And it's sort of, in terms of physics, it's not a bad theory. So he could explain, you know, Big Bang people would say, they, the reason they look red is because they're moving away. Svicky said, no, the reason they look red is because they're just massive galaxies and they, 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 they sap the light from the, the, the energy from the light. So he was interpreting it within his own world view. And similarly, um, this is a, a picture of the young Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle believed, didn't hate the idea of the Big Bang. Um, he was always, you know, to, almost to the day he died, he, he, he rejected the Big Bang hypothesis. He was always a very independent thinker. Uh, this is a picture of him as a little boy, because when he was a little boy, he bunked off school a lot. Um, he liked to learn things for himself. He said he learned to read by looking at the subtitles at his local flea pit cinema. He was very much self-taught and as an independent thinker. He said, he looked at the data, he said, oh, look, all the galaxies look red. That means they're moving away. He said, OK, I believe that they're moving away. So he didn't believe in tired light. He believed in a genuine uh, redshift, a cosmic uh, recession. But he said, although the universe is changing, it's, you know, it's, everything's moving away from us, the universe stays the same. And you think, well, how can something change and stay the same? Well... We're all changing. We, 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 hundreds of cells are dying every day, every second. But those cells are replaced. <coughs> so within three or four years, we're completely different people. And yet we kind of feel the same. Um, this is a cloud called a lenticular cloud. Um, it's at the top of a mountain where the winds are very, very high. So this cloud shouldn't stay there. It should get blown away. But it stays there for hours and hours and hours. <coughs> Sorry. Um, losing my voice a bit. It should get blown away. But the reason it stays there is that as the wind comes up this side, it blows the vapour up the mountain and it forms ice crystals and it adds to the cloud on that side. And the whole cloud gets blown across, and on this end, the ice crystals fall down, they warm up, and they turn to vapour, and they disappear. So the cloud is being added to at this end, it's being moved along on a conveyor belt, and it's falling away at this end. So the cloud is always changing, and yet it kind of remains the same. So that was Hoyle's hypothesis. The universe changes but stays the same. His idea was that the galaxies move apart, but then new galaxies pop up in the middle. New baby galaxies are born and created. So overall, the balance of galaxies remains the same. Um, this is the uh, best way to maybe explain it. In the Big Bang theory, imagine each of these dots is a galaxy. The universe expands, expands again. The galaxies get thinner and thinner and thinner, more and more spread out. The universe gets less and less dense. In Hoyle's view, what was called the steady-state universe, galaxies spread out, but baby galaxies pop up in the middle. Those mature into uh, grown-up galaxies, so this looks pretty much like that. It's bigger, but if the universe is infinite, it doesn't matter. D double infinity is still infinity. Or if the universe wraps around, it still sort of feels the same. So again, Hoyle could interpret the data in his own view. Um, he got the idea for this. Um, Hoyle worked alongside um, Thomas Gold and um, Sir Herman Bondi. And Gold was one day watching a film. This is a film called The Dead of Night. And it was, uh, it's an Ealing film, but it's not an Ealing comedy, it's an Ealing horror. <coughs> and it's the first horror film made after the war, because you couldn't make horror films during the war. And the film works like this. Um, it starts off with a young architect, gets out of bed, gets washed, gets dressed, gets in his car, goes to work, goes to a guest house where he meets some people. He says to them, look, I recognise you all, but I've never met you. And they say, well, how do you recognise us? And he says, well, you were in a dream I had last night. And they say, well, that's a bit strange. It doesn't really make sense. 
Um, but one by one, they all tell their own weird stories of weird experiences that they've had. And this is one of the stories that one of the house guests tell. <coughs> a young girl, uh, a young woman tells of a story when she was a young girl, when she went to a big party in a big house, and they were playing hide-and-seek. She went to hide in the attic, and when she went up to the attic, she saw this little boy who was crying, very distressed. So she calmed him down, put him to bed, and is now singing him a lullaby. We'll pick up the story there. So he then tells his ghost story, and then the other chap tells his ghost story, and the lady in the chair tells her little weird story. And when they've all, all told their weird stories, they all turn on the young architect, and they grab him by the neck, and they all begin to throttle him and strangle him to death. And suddenly he wakes up, and it's all been a nightmare. And he gets out of bed, and he gets so washed, and he gets dressed, and he gets in his car, and he drives to the countryside, and there's a guest house, and he meets these people, and he says, oh, I've never met you before. And they said, oh, but I do know you. And they say, oh, how's that? I said a weird dream about you last night. They all tell us. And the film goes round and round in a circle over and over again. So the film changes, it develops, has a plot, but it still stays the same. And that's what inspired Gold to come up with the idea of a steady state universe. So, <laughs> so here we are, 1950. Um, we have two theories of the universe. We have Fred Hoyle with his steady state universe, and we have uh, Georges Lemaitre with his Big Bang Theory of the Universe. Now, so far, um, well, let me just play you one last clip. This is the moment when the, theory, the Big Bang Theory was christened. Um, I said that's sort of where I was going to try and get to. Georges Lemaitre, as I said, talked about a day without a yesterday. The term Big Bang wasn't invented until 1951, and it was invented by the Big Bang's greatest critic. It was invented by Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle was giving a radio broadcast... And uh, the series was about our understanding of the universe. And I'll play you the clip in a second. It's only about a minute long. And just ten seconds before the end, he talks about the Big Bang, the very, very first time that phrase is ever used. And um, he says, you know, there are two theories of the universe. There's this one, and then there's this other one, the Big Bang. But let me, let me play the clip, because it's quite historic, I think. BBC 1950, Fred Hoyle christening the Big Bang Theory. The BBC presents the seventh talk in the series, The Nature of the Universe. The speaker is Fred Hoyle, a Cambridge mathematician and fellow of St John's College. Mr Hoyle. The mysterious feature of the universe is that the background material and the galaxies are inferred from observation to be in a state of expansion. What explanations have been offered to account for all this? First, I'll consider the older ideas. Broadly speaking, the older ideas fall into two groups. One of them is distinguished by the assumption that the universe started its life a finite time ago in a single huge explosion. On this supposition, the present expansion is a relic of the violence of this explosion. Now, this Big Bang idea 
seemed to me to be unsatisfactory even before detailed examination showed that it leads to serious difficulties. So almost a derisive comment. It was sort of meant to be a sort of a glib you know, phrase to um, explain what he thought was a rather poor theory. Now this Big Bang idea seemed to me to be unsatisfactory. So even though he sort of meant it as an insult, the name stuck. And ever since then we've, we've called it the Big Bang Theory, christened by its greatest critic. People have tried to come up with more... Uh, elegant titles uh, for this magnificent theory of the universe, something a bit more grand than Big Bang. Um, the only one that ever had any popular appeal uh, appeared in a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon strip where they called it the horrendous space kablooey. Um, <laughs> and there was a time where astronomers talked about the HSK, um, but now we're back with the Big Bang. Um, and there are sort of th three points I just want to end with. Um, <clears throat> As you know, two, two, I'm sure the other two will appear in, in questions, hopefully. Um, if not, do remind me and I'll come back to them. But the one point I really do want to emphasise is that I've sort of given the impression that scientists have their prejudices and their biases and, you know, you know, people see things in the data that they want to see. And that's true to an extent. But that's only true when you have very poor data. And the challenge of science is to get good data, hard data, and test which one of these is true. So what theorists will do is they'll say, look, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. If the Big Bang Theory is true, then this will happen. And then you go out and do that, and you test it, and if it happens, then the Big Bang may be true. If it doesn't happen, then you have to throw the Big Bang away. So although there is, you know, this is a human activity, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it is vulnerable to human frailties, at the end of the day, there is an objectivity that you can bring to bear. And that's what happened in the, in the last 50 years. This is 1951. In the years after that, um, people had to come up with tests for the Big Bang. This is a picture of... Um, this is Ralph Alpha here on the right. And he was a PhD student of George Gamow. And Gamow and Alpha said, if there was a Big Bang, you have this huge heat um, density from the Big Bang. And in that hot, dense phase after creation, the elements would have been cooked up. They would have been cooked up that a lot of hydrogen would have been turned into helium. And we can do the calculations, um, and we reckon, according to our nuclear calculations, for every 10 atoms of hydrogen, there should be one atom of helium. And then you look up at the stars, and that's what you see, a ratio of 10 to 1 hydrogen to helium. The only way you can explain that is with the Big Bang. Um, Gamow, uh, as I said, he was Alpha's tutor, his supervisor, and Gamow was a bit of a joker. So he said to Alpha, why don't we get my friend Hans Beta to be on the paper? Because then it'll be Alpha, Beta, Gamow. Um, <laughs> which was kind of a funny joke. But the problem is that Alpha was the poor junior researcher. He'd done a lot of the work, but he wasn't nearly as famous as Beta, who'd done nothing. And he wasn't as famous as Gamow. So people really forgot Alpha's story. He's still alive. He lives in upstate New York and um, really much the forgotten hero of the Big Bang. He even came up with a second prediction. He said, if there was a Big Bang, to start with, the universe would have been very, very dense, and the light would have been reacting and bouncing and scattering off everything. But at 400,000 years, <clears throat> the light would have suddenly been able to penetrate that, and it would have just glided through the universe, almost like the fog suddenly clearing. When the fog's there, you can't see anything because the light's scattering. When the fog clears, suddenly the light can sail through without any problem. And he said that light we should still see today, uh, except the light would be in the form of uh, microwaves because the light waves would have been stretched, and when you stretch light waves, you turn them into microwaves. If there was a Big Bang, we should, the universe should be filled with microwaves of a certain wavelength, and that's what he predicted. He put his neck on the line. If you find the microwaves, there have to be a Big Bang. If you don't find them, there couldn't have been. I'll skip through this. Um, is anybody here from Tulse Hill? Anybody want to know? <coughs> Mr. and Mrs. Huggins were from Tulse Hill. They measured the first ever redshift from a star. Um, these two people had a, a microwave uh, radio telescope, and they, were point, they wanted to uh, do some astronomy with it, and they pointed up at a bit of the sky where there should be nothing at all. They wanted to calibrate the telescope, check it was working. So when you do that, you want to point it at nothing and check that it sees nothing. And it, yet it, it was getting some microwaves. It was getting a, a sort of a, a noisy signal. 
So they checked all the wiring. Yeah, the noise was still there. They pointed it in a different direction. It was still there. They waited 12 hours. The noise was still there. There were some pigeons nesting inside, and the pigeons had deposited uh, what they called a white dielectric substance. <laughs> so they cleaned out the white dielectric substance. Uh, the noise hiss was still there. They captured the pigeons in a pigeon trap and flew them away, uh, took them away, and they couldn't get rid of this noise. In the end, they realised that was the microwave from the Big Bang. Exactly the right wavelength. In every direction, omnipresent, that's what Alpha had predicted. And that, that, that for, for cosmologists, I think, is the biggest proof in favour of the Big Bang. That's the pigeon trap they used. Uh, that's at the Smithsonian Museum at the moment. So I'm going to stop there, but I, so I've skipped a lot of stuff. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, but I started by saying James Jeans. He wrote a book about the state of the universe as it was understood in 1930, and Tallulah Bankhead loved it. Um, I've written my little book. I'm nowhere near as eminent as Sir James Jeans, but my, my dream is that Cameron Diaz will say that it contains what every girl should know. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. What happened to Alpha was the question. Did he get the Nobel? No, he, um, they came up with their ideas in 1948, 1949, and nobody believed them. Nobody took them seriously. Um, well, n n the, the, the establishment didn't. Um, and um, they got, got fed up, really. Alpha went and joined, I think he went and joined General Electric and became an industrial scientist. But, and, sorry, if science, you know, you say the hypothesis is proven, yeah. right, and it's now been proven, why... Like, why right. is he not respected? Okay, so then it, the two guys I showed you with the telescope made their discovery in 1965, some 15 years later. And a year or two before they made their discovery, somebody else reinvented the theory. Um, uh, Bob Dickey and... Oh, I've forgotten his colleague. They hadn't heard of Alpha. They were a new generation. They redid the calculation from fresh. And so they got a lot of the credit... And, uh, and Alpha, I think, at the time was very bitter about it. Um, you know, he said, you know, they never even invited me to come and visit the telescope and so on and so on. And uh, when Alpha... Uh, in the end, it's very difficult to decide who gets the prize. Only three people can get the prize. So should it have gone to Penzias and Wilson? Should it have gone to Penzias, Wilson and Gamow, but not Alpha? Should it have gone to Alpha? It's, 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 there are always controversy over this. Um, and in the end, it went to Penzias and Wilson. It went to somebody else completely different for some other breakthrough. So the theorists got no Nobel Prizes. And that's just the way science works sometimes. Um, and just a few days after that, um, Alpha had a very severe heart attack. It's almost as if the stress and the uh, sadness of really missing out um, took its toll on him. But well, I met him last year, and he really seems to have come to terms with it. You know, he... Um, looks back on those days with great fondness now, I think, but he's still very much a forgotten man. Well, my problem with the Big Bang is um, you can't have something out of nothing. There must have been something before the Big Bang. So, you know. Right, mm. so this is a complicated question and it requires illustrations and diagrams uh, because we're talking about really mind-bending ideas. So if I just show you a diagram, I think it'll begin to make some sense. So to start with, whoops, to start with, to start with, there was nothing. And then something went foom, and then there was something. And that's as good as I can do, I'm afraid. That's, <laughs> as, that's, as, that's as good as it gets. So, um, no, I think, I think it, it's a question that... What I've tried to do in the book, I, I touch on this in the epilogue a bit, because it's a valid question, um, but what I try and do in the book is I think, God, isn't it amazing how much we do know? Isn't it amazing we can explain where the elements came from? We can age the universe 13.7 billion years. Hubble got it slightly wrong. Um, you know, we can explain the evolution of galaxies. And actually, this is one of the points I wanted to make, which is that but cosmologists realise there are some things they don't know. They don't know how the universe is going to end. They don't really know what came before the Big Bang. And so there are lots of speculations, lots of theories. Um, 
one idea is that maybe the universe will expand, slow down, reverse, collapse in a big crunch, or maybe it'll be a big rebound and expand again. So maybe this Big Bang is just one in a series. Maybe universes can give birth to other universes. Maybe there was a universe before us and ours popped out of it. And maybe our universe will give birth to a new universe. Um, lots and lots of speculation. Um, and some people say, well, we'll never, ever know the answer to that. It's, it's, you know, that's the, it's beyond science, beyond the human imagination. But I think in around 1830, a French philosopher, Auguste Comte, said, there are some things we will never, ever know. And he drew up a list of the things that we will never know. And one of them was, we will never know what the stars are made of. And ten years after he died, people knew what the stars are made of. They could do spectroscopy and work out. So we now, it seems impossible to answer this question, but the next generation might suddenly realise what the answer is, if, you know, if that can be found. My, the first time I ever spoke about the Big Bang was in Edinburgh. And the um, very first question I ever got on the very first talk was, what went bang? And uh, it's a very sweet lady. She was actually Neil Turok's teacher. I, people know Neil, great cosmologist. She was his teacher. She said, what went bang? So I explained a few things to her, tried to explain. And, um, but then I pointed out that St. Augustine had been asked a similar question. The theological equivalent of what came before the Big Bang is what was God doing before he created the universe? And um, when, when St. Augustine was asked, you know, what was God doing before he created the universe, he said uh, he was creating hell for people who ask questions like you. <laughs> <laughs> she was very, she, she laughed. She, she, she was quite happy with that. Yes. Uh, my question is, how did they reconcile the disparity between the time they took to from the Big Bang, and the, the actually age of the Earth. So you Hubble, said it Hubble, was one and, one Hubble estimates it to be one or two billion years, yeah. and now we know it's between 10 and 20. People seem to think about 13.7. Mm. But the reason is, um, so if I see an object, and it's uh, a certain distance away, and it's moving at a certain speed, I can work out the time. Now, the time is wrong. Clearly, Hubble got it wrong. So maybe the object is further away. If it's further away, it would have taken longer. Or maybe it's moving more slowly. He obviously got one measurement wrong, either the time, the distance, or the speed. Turned out he got the distance wrong. Um, he made about four mistakes. And every time somebody d found a mistake, it doubled the age of the universe. So about five years later, it was four billion years ago. Five years later, it was about eight billion, then 12, and, and so on. And um, one of the errors is that the way... It's very hard to measure the distance to a star um, because stars have different brightnesses. If you see a star and um, it's 100 times dimmer than the sun, you might think, oh, it's 10 times further away because 10 squared is 100. But it might be a very, very bright star that's 1,000 times further away. Or it might be a very, very dim star that's quite close. So... Um, so you have to know the absolute, the inherent brightness of the star. If you know its actual brightness, then you can work out how far away it is. Because it appears this bright, but I know it's that bright, so I can work out the distance. The woman I mentioned earlier, Henrietta Levitt, who worked as one of the computers, she discovered, a, a, or John Goodrick discovered a star which varies, called a Cepheid variable. So it goes brighter and dimmer over the course of a few nights or a few weeks. She found out that the longer the period of variation, the brighter the star. And uh, therefore, if you find a Cepheid variable in a galaxy, you can see how quickly it varies. If you see how quickly it varies, you know exactly how bright it is. And if you know exactly how bright it really is, you can see what it appears to be, and you can work out the distance. The trouble is there are two types of Cepheids. And uh, so you build a, a yardstick for measuring the universe, but Hubble didn't, didn't realise that there were two different types, so you actually need two different yardsticks, and that caused one of the doublings. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I wonder if you could confirm, please, 
Um, I was stunned to learn about six months ago, in my 68th year, that the interference you get on television when it's not tuned in properly is in fact caused by this microwave radiation. Is that correct, please? That's right. I think about, so, so this Big Bang radiation, these microwaves coming from... The, the, people sometimes call it uh, the echo of the Big Bang. Um, you can detect that through, through your TV aerial. And, or on, if you're tuning your radio set. You know, nowadays, everything's digital, and it just jumps straight from one station to another. But if you get in between stations and you hear that hiss or that snow on your TV screen, about 10% of that is microwaves from the Big Bang. So if anybody ever says there's nothing on TV tonight, you say, no, you've got to watch the Big Bang. So, no, that's true. That's absolutely true. It's often recommended that we visualise the expanding universe and the expanding galaxies in a way of a, a balloon being blown up with the galaxies attached to this membrane is that a good picture yeah. to have in one's mind yeah it's very good for two reasons um it's <clears throat> i I've, I've had a slide in there and i skipped through it but let's imagine that we're all galaxies and that this is the surface of a balloon here yeah, that's right. Yeah, yes. So it's closed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about people. I think maybe uncertain about the shape of the universe. But there are two points that, that kind of work either way. If this room doubled in size, um, you wouldn't be moving away from me. It's the floor that's expanding. So similarly, people think it's space that's expanding and carrying the galaxies with it. And the other point is that you might think that we're at the centre of the universe because all the galaxies are moving away from us. But if this room suddenly doubled in size, I would see all of you moving away from me, but the gentleman at the back would see me moving away from you. So you would think you were at the centre of the universe. So one way is to think that we're all at the centre of the universe, or more, probably more re realistically, there isn't really a centre of the universe. And the balloon analogy sort of helps explain both of those uh, situations. The balloon has a centre. Well... The, 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 the yes, there is a centre to the image. That's right. Yeah, the problem with that is is that for that to be realistic, you actually have to imagine that nothing exists below or above the skin. The skin of the balloon is the entirety. It's everything that possibly exists. And suddenly things become really hard to imagine. I, I, I did a a discussion event where I only spoke for about 15 minutes and then it was all discussions for about an hour and a half. And I uh, had a cosmologist with me, um, and uh, Chris Birkinshaw. And, um, and he said, you know, people think that cosmologists can imagine this. And we can't. We just have to accept it. We do. It's too simple as a There's no Yes. That was once But as the balloon shrinks to a point... Then that's yeah, divine. We, we mustn't think that there was once a centre, but in fact it's still there, it's empty. And we've now gone beyond it in this balloon expanding way. So yeah, there's a very good book called Flatland by Edwin Abbott. Yes. Is that right, Edwin Abbott? Which I think helps to explain some of this. It's it's um he talks about beings and we live in three dimensions and we're used to living in three dimensions. And he talks about beings that live in two dimensions and they have no no concept of an above or below. And they live their entire world on this surface, sliding around on it. Um, and I found, I haven't read it for many years, but I found that useful to help me make that. It's almost a leap of faith. It's more than a leap of faith, because if you can do the mathematics, you can see the logic as well. But beyond the logic, I think there's a point where you have to just, just, just believe that that holds true. Uh, could you suggest, uh, by extrapolation uh, from this present point, any scientific procedure or improvement in technology uh, to further convince us, us of the reality of the Big Bang rather than anything else? Right. Um, I think. I think the. Um I mentioned there are two tests that have already been done, the hydrogen-helium ratio and the echo of the Big Bang. And then also the, the, the echo of the Big Bang, although it appears perfectly smooth, 
when you analyse it in detail, it has a few bumps in it. And that's very important because that's seeded the galaxies. Another way you can prove the Big Bang is that if, if Hubble, if Hoyle was right, then you know, there are baby galaxies popping up everywhere. And there should be baby galaxies around us. And yet there aren't any. All the galaxies around us are about our age, the Milky Way's age. So I think a lot of the big tests have already been done. But um, the gentleman here pointed out it's one of the big unknowns in cosmology. And another of the big unknowns is um, how the universe got to be so lumpy, how you get clusters of galaxies and matter here and emptiness here. And one way to explain that is a period after the Big Bang called inflation, where the universe doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled inside, in size. And that would have helped to have caused flu density fluctuations. Now, that's a, that's, you can sort of say that's part of the Big Bang theory. You know, the Big, the Big Bang needs that to sort of make it complete. And there's a satellite going up in 2007, I think, called Planck. And it wants to measure... Now, if inflation happened, it should leave evidence on the echo of the Big Bang. And Planck is going to measure the echo even, in even more detail and try and find the fingerprints of inflation. And if it does that, that will be a technological scientific breakthrough, an observational breakthrough, that makes the Big Bang even healthier. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you'd all like to thank Simon very much for a wonderful hour. And, uh,